what we have, I keep forgetting next week. Next week. Okay. Oh, basically. I keep forgetting next week is the winter recess, so I've got a long list of things to do in preparation for next week, but next week is a good week for good things. Oh. Um, so what we're going to cover this week, we've covered the tutor spells in that particular place. We're jumping into mostly protostomes. So we're going to cover platforms and other pilot on Wednesday. We're going to discuss the analysts. We're going to have two lectures on the analysts. The first one will be this Wednesday. And then in lab this week, remember an announcement over the weekend, we have the lab practical coming up. And along with that, lab notebooks are due in class. So just make sure you bring them to class with you as you normally do. And then next week, if you didn't remember, I assume you all know, is midwinter recess. Following the recess, we'll have a second lecture on the analysts, and then that Wednesday is when the exam, second exam will open. So it will cover everything from core dates to analysts. And I think I originally had it scheduled to open up immediately on Monday, but I'm going to open it up on Wednesday and then have it go through Sunday. I want multiple days and because our lab on Thursday and Friday is covering these groups in lab, I wanted it to close reasonable time for everyone to have that laboratory experience. Otherwise, I think I had it opening on Monday and then closing Wednesday night. I expand, I change those dates just because it seems more practical for you all. Um, the proposed research articles. All of you should have received comments. Um, most look like great articles. Many of them look very interesting. And so I said, you know, go for it. I think I had very few comments on those. Where there was a potential issue, and you're being asked to resubmit, it's just a small fraction of them. There are comments in there about why the particular research article didn't fit the requirements for the assignment. And then the last thing is I would go and look at the article and think how complicated, how complex is it? I have my expertise, and when I look at something, it may be complex to me, but it may be simple to you because that's part of your expertise. But some advice I know I gave to certain submissions, those that were approved, was this looks great, it looks interesting, but it looks really complicated. And so part of the challenge in doing a good summary is in synthesizing the information in the paper and then putting what they did in your own words. Right? I don't need details about the statistical approaches or that they did this or that particular molecular analyses or what have you, but an overview of what they did and what they found. I want to be able to understand from how you summarize the paper. Right? I don't have to go to the paper because it's very confusing in your summary. So the challenge is having a paper that you can easily comprehend. That doesn't mean you can't, you know, you may be reading something. I do this all the time. I'm reading something and I have to go to another reference because something in the paper I'm reading I don't quite understand and the authors did not describe it well. So that's probably going to be normal for this assignment for you all, but don't make it too complicated on yourself. If you constantly have to look up references to understand what somebody did, the paper may not be the best for doing this assignment. So. Even if you have your paper approved, please just go back through it and, and read it again if you haven't already. Turn to the methods and the results sections to see if you can express what you proposed into your in your own words in your summary. And if you can't, I'll be willing to, to hear you know proposals for a new research article. But because 
your paper's already been approved, submitting it through the assignment tool won't work, so you're gonna have to email me if that situation arises. But it's in your best interest. Look at these papers now, because a week before the assignment, ooh, I don't wanna hear somebody say, hey, I finally read my paper and it seems way too complicated. Can I pick something else? Then it's kind of late. And, and I know I've talked to a few of you who, who chatted with me already about potential articles they had identified and wanted to get my impressions on them. In some cases, you know, the, the student il illustrated a very good understanding of what was done in that paper. While, you, while it's still fresh in your head, you could begin working on that summary assignment. That's fantastic. Right? You've spent some time reading through the paper, finishing it now, you know, well in advance of the, the deadline is a great, great thing to do. And it's kind of making use of the time you've already committed to understanding part of that. Right. Right. Any questions about Research on reassignment or other items coming up, uh, practical, so forth. No? Okay. Great. So what we are planning to cover today is first of all discuss this phyla, Venus Seelomorphans, which was a little video I showed at the beginning, featured a member of this phylum, and the Mesozoans phylum that our book continues to follow, but which may not be a valid group. Then focus on lophotrophozoans. Within the phylogerians, we've already focused on the deuterosomes. Now we're going to focus on the protostomes. And, and one of the major groups within that is the lophotrophozoans. The other are the ectoxosomes, which we covered the last part of the semester. Then, predominant feature of this uh, today's assigned chapter is on the platforms, which include free living, turbularians, as well as the parasitic groups and cestodes, tapeworms. Then there are a bunch of Phyla that we will quickly examine that share most for the most part they share similar structures in common they share jaws they are not different phyla and then the, this odd little phyla here the gastrotrix the belly is a phyla anyone know how many phyla we've covered to date? We spent several days just talking about chordates. Right. Only covered seven so far. You know how many have we covered today? Nine. A lot of these are minor five. A lot of these I've never seen living in town. But these are, these include the diversity of animal life, so we're going to spend some time presenting them today. Before we do that, if there's something interesting you've read about these taxa in our text in preparation for today's lecture, or some unique experience, I don't want to hear any paperwork stories, but any unique experiences you've had with organisms that we're going to cover today, that would be fantastic. We do have a cool paperwork story I could give that time. Anyone have anything interesting from the chapter or any experiences they've had with these taxa? Yeah. For tapeworms, they don't have to be have a gut. Right, tapeworms do not have a gut. And that's an interesting thing that we will see when we examine the phylogeny of the platyhelminthes. The most flatworms tend to only have a blind gut. They have a mouth pharynx, and intestine, but they don't have an anus. Within the parasitic cestodes, which are highly derived, they've completely lost that. And this is a common feature that we'll see in the evolution of parasites throughout animals, that parasitic groups, you can think about the, the life cycle of a tapeworm, the adults living within guts, predominantly vertebrates, 
they are able to absorb nutrients directly into their tissues, so they don't need to consume them. So it's an interesting feature about the tapeworms. They have no gut, but it's a common feature. Lots of various characteristics that we see in the evolution of various animal parasites. Something else may have learned. I can't think of any direct experiences or interactions I've had with these groups. But I did, you know, on reading the text, there are a few things I read and thought, oh yeah, that was a really cool feature about some of these groups. Nothing? Are they that boring? Oh, I hope I give a better introduction to these groups than our text that said. So the one thing I guess that that I made a note of in my head is something to share is you tell me this is gonna happen all day. Is that going on? You tell me. Anyone know what that term refers to? And the various groups that we cover today exhibit this phenomenon. Nobody knows? Yes. I think every time I read this chapter, that sticks in my head. Or when I go through my notes, I remember that from the chapter reading. You tell me the condition found in organisms in which you have a constant number of cells. Rotifers and acanthocephalins, which are groups that we're going to cover, are two such groups that have a constant number of cells within their body, within certain tissues, and so forth. Our book describes a situation, I think somebody in the early part of the 1900s had various counts for cells, in particular tissues of the organisms that were being studied. I don't know about you, but I'm doing microscopic examination of specimens. I don't think I'm counting cells. So it's quite intriguing that we've even you know, discovered this phenomenon present. I mean, within some of these organisms, they are quite minute. Rotifers are quite minute. So counting cell number mm -hmm. isn't so bad. But acanthocephalins can be, can be larger. I'm not sure who, who counted those cells. But it's a very interesting feature that some of the groups we'll be discussing today exist. By chance, that remind anyone else of anything else they discovered in their chapter reading? I'm thinking about regeneration. A lot of flatworms exhibit amazing regenerative abilities. Nothing. So remember, for annelids, we're going to cover annelids on Wednesday. We have chapter reading. I forget what that chapter is. Off my head. Chapter 9, maybe? 10? Come with something interesting that you've read in the chapter about that one. So, this is the big tree from our text and the phyla that we're going to present. This one, <coughs> realize this is kind of incorrect. Xenocelomorpha is a phylum that is considered within phylogeria. I guess I didn't double check this with the tree in our text, but I'm pretty sure they include that within phylogeria. These are bilateral organisms. So we're, we've already entered into phylogeria, focusing on the deuterostomes. The other major group that we're going to tackle are the, the protostomes. Within the protostomes, we have those two major groups I discussed already, ectisozoa, ectiso, refers to the fact that they molt. These are molting animals. And then local trochozoans. These are claves of organisms that were recognized through molecular phylogenetics prior to us having trees Denoting the relationships of animals, we group things based on aspects of their development and so forth. And some were correct and some applied to this. But this 
the molecular results required a drastic rethinking of relationships of animals. Ecbysozoa was not recognized prior to molecular phylogenies. Once it was put together, though, it was recognized that all of these groups have external cuticle that they mold. So it is a feature shared by all members of this group, suggesting that the common ancestor of all these had that. Nobody previously had said, oh, all these are molting animals. They share common ancestry. Because they're a diverse set of various taxa, including the arthropods and worm-like beasts. Lophotrochozoa is a term that is a composite of two terms. Lopho refers to a lophophore, which is a feeding structure of various members of this group, brachiopods and peronids, as well as ectopods, exhibit a feron, a lophophore. Or how we fix that. But we're okay, we're over here. Trochozoa refers to the trochophore. Troch, tuft. So tuft bearing now, organisms. These are larval stages. Various groups, moss and annelids and trochophore larvae, trochophore like larvae exhibited by various other groups. It encompasses a large number of phyla. Not all phyla, though, have lophophores, not all phyla have trochophores, so it's kind of not an ideal name. Alternatively, this group is also referred to as spiralia. Well, guess what? Spiral cleavage. Because taxa, those taxa within this group exhibit spiral cleavage. Whereas tectbysozoans tend to be similar to diterostomes and then most of them exhibit a leader like cleavage. Or a modified type of radial cleavage. The xenocelomorpha I didn't learn about this when I was a classroom like this when I was an undergrad. It's a composite of two formerly recognized groups. This is kind of a new name. Previously, it was known as acela. Acela, you know what that means? No body cavity. When we describe different developmental modes of organisms and describe the acelomate, body. The example we gave for that, and the example I gave, was the flatworms. Flatworms have an acelomate body. Acels, which are small, worm-like animals, share characteristics with flatworms. Acela, Ciliated upper pyramids, ventral mouth, blind gut, four hundred and forty species or so of small worms were 
originally placed within the flat earths because they were similar and exhibited features that flatworms exhibit. Flatworms, I haven't described this already, is a common name for platy helminthes. Helminth is a worm, platy, plate like, or flat. Flatworms. So A seals were previously grouped with flatworms. The free living type of flatworm. Xenoturbellids, most of these are deep water species that also have a ciliated isotopes. Their affinity wasn't very well known. They've been placed in various groups. But ultimately, molecular phylogenetic results showed that these two groups shared an ancestor. And so instead of being recognized as distinct phyla, they're grouped within this single phylum, the zine AC lamorphans, which includes these two groups. And that, again, another comp composite word based on who's included within them. So this is a molecular phylogeny from six years back showing xenoturbellids, xenoturbellopathy, and these aceals that group together in a monophyletic way. So this was the evidence that they're a distinct group. We look at where they fall, and this is represented within our text tree in terms of this is the sister group for the remainder of the phylogenetics. Additional studies, though. More recent, this is from 2019, show a slightly different position. Xena coelomorpha is still a monophyletic group, so it's a good taxon. But they're shown to be sisters to hemicornates and canines. I hope many of you are thinking, wait a minute, you told me chordates were the sister of hemichordates and echinoderms. Hemichordates and echinoderms and ambulacraria. And then chordates are the sister in a group, Deuterostomia. That's not what these molecular results support. Moreover, chordates in this tree, these are shown to be a sister of protosomes. So we no longer, these results at least don't support monophyly of deuterostomes. Another study that came out just a couple of years back kind of evaluating two different hypotheses. One of these we've already talked about, and that is where the tenophores fall out in the tree. The other thing they did in response to the previous molecular results was where do the ambulacrades and the chordates and the xenocelomorphs fall out? Are xenocelomorphs really the sister of the ambulacrades? And at least based on this study, what they do support, they support the fact that sponges are most basal, 
and they support this hypothesis, that Z and coelomorphins are most closely related to the ambulocrarians. And chordates are assisted to protostomes. So just that deuterostomia is not a natural grouping, and that those groups that we previously discussed that are members of that clade are not monophyletic. One thing, and this is the, the earlier 2019 study. One thing I want you to pay attention to, which you cannot see on there, but if you look at the little, the branches that are separating out those different groups, they're rather small, which means for the molecular results, there's not much going on at these early branches, summarized here. The other thing that they indicate on this tree is the low levels, this is going to be aggravating, the low levels of support for those particular plates. I remember the numbers, 55 and 60. Uh, that suggests, you know, this is percent support for those branches. Very low levels of support for those. I don't think the, this recent paper definitely solves this issue. But some of the relationships that we've, we've talked about in class that are tests reveals may not be the actual relationships may not be an accurate representation of the separation of the lineages this is pre-cambrian time that these things are separate it may have been rather rapid we may not have the ability to accurately determine these particular branches but it places Xena coelomorpha into an interesting light because it's been breaking up the deuterostomes. So acelomorphs, again, somewhere around 440 species. The vast majority of them are marine. What I could find, there are only three freshwater species. The rest are marine organisms. They're rather minute, just a few millimeters in length. You should see a scale bar on these drawings because they look rather large. But they're very small, flat, simple worms. Most of these being monations. Most of them are free living, but some can be parasitic. I'm not sure what the fractions are. Some can be, most are benthic, but some may be pelagic, so you can sample them in a water bottle. Xenotravelids. Xeno, you don't know what xeno? Xenophobia, fear of strange, different things, right? So these are, this refers to the fact that they're the strange animals discovered in the first half of the 1900s. And so strange, xeno, turbella, I guess you think of, of turbid movement, turbo, Motion, turbellids are the free living platyphelminthes. Turbellaria is the group, I should say turbellaria because it's a parapolitic group. Turbella is kind of move motion. And I assume that the name was referring to the fact that these look like flatworms there, but they're strange free living flatworms, strange turbellarians. Similar to the ACOs, they have a ventral mouth, a blind gut. They're very simple in terms of they possess two cell layers. Try to unplug this and plug it back in. Yeah. 
they do have nerves and muscles. And uh, currently, we saw the, for those who saw the movie, or the clip at the beginning, some species were recently described from deep sea collections. We only know to date six species. So most of this phylum, the Xenos coelomorpha, is comprised of the Aceos that have over 400 species within it. Like the Aceos, these are also monoecious. Capable individuals are simultaneous hermaphrodites, capable of producing both sperm and eggs. So this, when I talked about the lophotrochosomes, referring to the fact that the lophophore, this is that feeding organ that some of the phyla within this clade possess. But again, not all. We'll see them in a few weeks when we talk about the lophophore taxa and other close relatives. And then the trochophore larva. This won't work if it keeps doing this. Which is a typical feeding larva of various phyla that are members of the world. Complete the gaps, these rings of cilia, and there's variation from group to group, but the general appearance is similar to this. So, within the lophotrophozoans, we're going to cover the platyzoans. We're going to cover platyzoans. But first, talk about this group, which is featured in the chapter that was assigned for today. It's included along the platyzoans and xenos hemomorphies. So mesozoans, kind of like middle animals, is a name given to these rather simple very small ciliated animals. And there's two main groups that are recognized in the planet. There are 150 species of mesozoans. They're very small. You see in the illustration. Ciliated. A coelomate. They have no coelom. Most are parasitic. Within various Inverts. And there are two main groups. Orthonectida and I don't know how to spell it wrong. Cells by Sienna to make these have you know, 20 to 30 cells that comprise the body. They were in the past considered to represent a derived flatworm. They exhibit flatworm characteristics. Ciliated 
cells, AC will make condition. So, good enough reason for placing it within the thiazones. Maybe both dioecious as well as monoecious and in one species. They also engage in both sexual and asexual reproduction. This is a orthonectid that dwells within the flatworms. You can see this particular flatworm is chock full of them. Diciamids, though, occur in renal sacs of various cephalopods. And they have asexual and sexual stages. Asexual stages, known as the matogen, the rhombogen, are the sexual stages. This particular species illustrated here is a hermaphrodite, so there's hermaphroditic tissues here that are producing gametes, both male and female gametes. Fertilization takes place within the individual, so it engages in self fertilization, and then the larval type develops within the parent. And then these are released, and they can infect additional hosts. When they're infected, they can develop into the nematogen. And the nematogen <coughs> produces embryos within it through budding. And then these are released, and they can give rise to additional nematogens or they can give rise to the rhombogen stage. So it's a very complex life cycle that some of these individuals show. However, molecular phylogeny can mess everything up, right? It's, it's, here it comes again, and some of these options are similar to what we've seen before. I think these are the people who just want to mess with us. And change how we view some of these groups. These two are people who are interested in figuring out where some of these odd groups fall out within the tree of life. First, so we have diciamids and orthonectids. First is a paper from 2018, just a few years ago, that placed orthonectids within the annelids. Annelids are ringworms, annula for rings. Earthworms and various other marine analysts, as well as leeches. So, the orthonectids, based on molecular phylogen phylogenetic results, are actually just analysts. Diciamida, the diciamids, so don't fall out with any other group. Highly degenerate analyst worms, they're parasites. Can you get Evolution of parasitic life science, you get the loss of various features related to that. Do they look like analids? No, because they've lost many of the features that analids exhibit. Here is that tree, orthonectids falling out here. This larger pinkish area here represents analida, and orthonectids falling out within it, diciamida falls out here with no affinity to any other groups. Anyone notice anything interesting about this tree? What is unique? And it's, it's actually a unique feature that pertains to the orthonectids and the diciamids. Look at those, where they occur. Compare them to all the other groups, all the other branches in those trees. What do you notice about the branches leading to diciamida and orthonectida?
The early branches are. Oh, well, for those, so those are hard. So getting sequences of these groups is probably very difficult. Getting examples to, to sequence. So they only have one member. So that, that kind of is not fair for them. But it's, it's, it's limitation of what they have available to them. I'm not sure if any additional work has been done there since, but what else? I think it's, it's part of why it's not so easy to discern. It's all the different colored blocks. But what are so they can have two to what and they're unknown species. They're very complicated bees. Look how long the branches. The branches are drawn long just to kind of say, hey, this is where these beasts fall out. No, the branch reflects. Remember, this is a phylogram. Branch lengths reflect the amount of evolution that's occurred on that branch. And in this case, because it's a molecular phylogeny, it's the changes in the DNA sequences on those branches. Lysiamida, very long branch. Orthomectida, very long branch for both. Why such long branches? Well, Presumably, there has been lots of stuff going on within these lineages related to the evolution of the parasitic lifestyle. One, so there are some that have relatively long branches elsewhere in this clade, but these are by far the longest. Now, I don't expect any of you to be experts in phylogenetic approaches, but there is a phenomenon referred to as long branch attraction where you have a lot of evolution within a particular branch, they may attract to other branches spuriously when there's not a good phylogenetic signal present. So it's a statistical artifact. Not everyone has taken this and said orthonectids are analytes, but because of the potential phylogenetic complications. I do not know of any or morphological features of orth orthomectids have been identified that analytes share. So this is still somewhat controversial. And and, and I, I want to say, whenever, you know, I'm presenting controversy all the time. Today we have chordates aren't related to endocrines. It's, it's odd, right? Not to shake up our, you know, understanding of animal diversity. But to say, this is an evolving field, and new data can shed light on relationships that we previously didn't know. So it, it can be frustrating that every few years, the text has to update itself. If you have a previous edition of the text, it doesn't talk about Xena coelomorpha. It refers to them as two separate files, right? So the text evolves while the, the field evolves. And I know I showed this this table at the very beginning, I love, or this tree at the very, I think the very first or second lecture. And I said, I like it. It, it shows a different number of phyla than what we refer to in the class. And part of that was with regard to the Dicey Evans, that they are recognized by these authors as a distinct clade. And orthonectids, I assume, are included within the analytes of the All right. So the remainder of the class to focus on members of this clade, flat zones, flat animals, and this this clade is another one of those clades that has been supported in some molecular phylogenetic results, but not in others. I'm not going to go through the alternative understandings of the relationships of these, but this is the one that our book tends to follow. Flat animals, referring to the flat aspect. Largely the fighting homunities, most of these others are rather minute groups in terms of the size of the animals that are included within them. The tree from our text, if you have an earlier edition of the text, this is not the tree that you'll get. Tree of our text, well, shows Princess Owens here, not 
as part of local trophozoans, um, but Platyozoa is considered to represent this group. Platyhelminthes, and, and you see some molecular tests which unite these, but otherwise there are no diagnostic features that unite all members of these groups. Platforms, Platyhelminthes we'll cover first. Again, the plat platforms, free living platforms, as well as the parasitic versions, the, the flukes, trematodes, and the cestodes, the tapeworms, and then these additional five. So relationships, you know, here it's a polytomy with these three clades coming out. This clade is one that has been supported recently from molecular phylogenetic results in which ketonaths are placed with these other beasts that have little jaws with typically within their pharynx and associated with their mouth. Ketonaths were previously not considered to be closely related these, to these until molecular phylogenetic results supported them. And then what do they share in common with the others? They share in common aspects of their morphology in terms of the presence of jaw and teeth that we find in most of these other forms. So this is, these groups are put together into the clay Naptifera, at the stones, we just talked about that. Last week, Ifera, it could be a pH or an F, refers to bearing, so jaw bearing. These are jaw bearing phyla. They share in common, molecular results support that, and they have jaws that appear to be homologous. Most members of this group show that. Rotifers have jaws. Acanthocephalins do not. Acanthocephalins are endoparasites, various vertebrates, and they have little hooks that they use to attach, but they don't have jaws that resemble those of the other groups. They have lots of jaws, they have no, no gut, like tapeworms. They've lost the gut, they occur within intestines, and so similar to cestodes, they, uh, they can just absorb nutrients, they have a derived condition by which they do not possess it again. What we have this relationship, it's supported by molecular results, but it's a weird relationship because rotifers and acanthocephalins are not similar in their overall appearance. So molecular results supported that. And what they do, though, possess is this uteli that I talked about earlier. They have a epidermis that is syncytial. We talked about this term already. Together cells. So a common membrane surrounding multiple nuclei. And in this case, they're eutelic syncytial. So it's, it's not a constant number of cells per se, but a constant number of nuclei in this case because it's a syncytial tissue. That unites them along with the molecular data. So clays and the syndermata together skin because of the syncytial nature of their epidermis. The platyhelminthes are the biggest group we'll cover. Again, common name for these platforms, what the name itself refers to. But it contains distinct groups, turbularians, trematodes, montania, and cestodes. So turbularians, you can see here. Paraphyletic assemblage, so we should put that in quotations. There are 
features that are presumably present the common ancestor of these beasts, graphite cells, which are cells involved in mucus production, endolesical eggs, endolesical. I know I didn't get through all the larval ecology. But I think I got to the point where I discuss planktotrophic and lesopotrophic larvae. Planktotrophic are those that are capable of feeding on plankton. Lesopotrophic are those that feed on Yolk. So lesotho refers to yolk. Endo lesotho refers to the fact that the yolk is within, which is most cases within eggs of marine invertebrates. So inner. The yolk is provided with the, the egg. What unites some turbellarians with the other flatworms, the flukes and the cestodes, are the presence of ectolesical eggs. And then we all know what that means, right? Outer yolk. So in these particular species, yolk is produced externally to the egg and is provided to the egg. External. Three metodes, so separate from this group of turbularians, are the three metodes, Longinians and Testas, that are in a clade together. <coughs> they do not possess these graphites that are found within turbularians. And they have a syncytial pegging. This doesn't say ancestrally on these pads, but turbularians have a ciliated outer covering, ciliated epidermis. Trematodes and flukes, trematodes, flukes, and tapeworms don't have ciliated epidermis. Instead, what they have is this outer cell layer, pegament, that is syncytial. So it's referred to, in this case, not together skin, like we saw for the rotifers and the acanthocephalus, <coughs> but new skin. They have a different skin relative to the other body Within the turbularians, we see differences, major differences in aspects of their digestive tract. There's macrostomids, a relatively simple pharynx that leads into simple intestine, like we've already talked about. So these, these have line guts or cestos. <coughs> No gut. So we have a mouth, a ventrally located mouth in turbularians. A mouth of trematodes and monogenians. There's anterior end. And within the turbularians, Different groups are recognized and they have different types of intestine. There are those that form many branches, polyclavida, 
many clades, many branches. This is the triclade even, so here's the opening, and it opens into three branches. Turbolarians, again, are free living. Flatworms. Somewhere around 4 to 5,000 species recognized. There are marine ones, freshwater ones, and terrestrial species. Terrestrial ones, they rely so, on carrying moist habitat. Most are monoecious. So they tend to engage in outcrops. So very little, if any, self fertilization. Figure from text. <laughs> Flatworms are the typical acelomate taxon. They do not possess a coelom. What's their coelom comprised of? Parenchyma that is composed of mesoderm tissue, mesodermally derived tissues. It's solid. The only openings we see are associated with the gut cavities, the intestine. So here's the pharynx and the intestine. So there's a cross section through here, an illustration of a cross section through here showing the pharynx, and then the intestine that are running down the lengths of the animal. This is the triclad, poly, poly, um, turbulent, platy hominids, rhabdites, are located in the epidermis and involve the secretion of mucus that are dual gland adhesive organs that are associated with movement in many free living platforms. They allow for production of a sticky type mucus that is going to hold and then a release of that sticky, other chemicals release that allows for that sticky chemical mucusy like substance to release. So it enables them to glide over surfaces. Many species produce larvae. So they have indirect development. The larvae exhibit a variety of different shapes, and there are many different names that apply to larvae. Those who study larval ecology of flatworms have a lot of diversity to take into account. Roller larvae, Cato's larvae, goat's larvae, larvae, these have cilia associated with them, feeding type larvae. There are others that direct, develop directly and do not have distinct larval stages. And then there are various marine and freshwater species that produce cake capsules and deposit embryos. They should be called embryo capsules because they hold embryos. The fertilized eggs are deposited within the egg capsules, as you can even see, you can't see in this freshwater species, but in this marine species, these different pairs of eyes, multiple individuals within each individual egg capsule. These other groups all parasitic forms. Most are endoparasites, the monogenetic flukes, these are common gill parasites of fishes. The ectoparasites they occur outside of the body. And there are a variety of different groups. Espidogastria, the digenetic, the monogenetic flukes, and the tapeworm. Aspidogastria is a rather small group. I, I don't even think our book discusses much about it. Aspido, referring to a shield, gastria, stomach, relatively small group of flukes that parasitize 
marine and freshwater mollusks predominantly, but they may have a stage that also has to pass through a vertebrate. Oftentimes it's, it's a, a fish or a turtle. They can exist solely within mollusks where they go through developmental stages and then produce free-swimming larval forms that then can be taken up by additional snails or by valves as shown here. So there are a variety of species that may be affected by these. They don't appear to be species specific like we find in a lot of the other platform flukes. The larval forms kind of shown here do have this is referred to as false suckers for the anterior uh, suckers and posterior ends that may be associated with attachment within host. Diagenetic flukes are, many of those can be caused for horrible diseases within humans. Schistosomes are one such group. And they occur within veins associated with internal organs of humans. It's, it, schistosomes are an odd or flatworms, loops in general, because they are bony shifts. Males and females, males and females are morphologically distinct. The bigger individual is the male, the smaller individual is the female. Reproduce within a host, and then, depending on which type of schistosome you are, they come out in urine or in feces, and so they get prevalent. The eggs are deposited. Eggs get only a little encapsulated embryos, essentially. The eggs are released either in feces or urine. If they go into a water body. The larvae within the capsule hatches. It produces, releases eggs, which are essentially encapsulated embryos. Larvae that are referred to as Miracinia hatch within the water. So you can see these are kind of encapsulated. This is a released Miracidium stage or Miracidium larva. It gets taken up or it infects various snails. They can burrow into the tissues or they may be eaten, taken up with some food that the snail eats. Within the infected snail, they develop into sporocysts. And sporocysts, it's horrible. They can engage in, ouch, I don't know if you heard that. Yeah, that was horrible, sorry. I scratched the, the blackboard, don't think about it. They can engage in asexual selection or asexual reproduction to produce additional sporocysts within the host. They can then release the perrier, which are these little pale beasts into the water. And then these cercaria can essentially burrow into skin migrate through the host to find appropriate living conditions and continue, for example. 2019, 
240 million required preventative care. It's estimated to include many deaths. It's hard to evaluate deaths due to schistosomes, blood flukes, but it's probably a large number of people each year dying from these blood flukes. How do that's that's an excellent question. How do you know you're infected? So to look that up because I'm not sure how you would know that you're infected with it. I, I assume there's a test for it. I assume there are conditions that you would exhibit, but off the top of my head, I don't remember what those are. So we can look that up. A type of of schistosome that some of us maybe more familiar with are uh, swimmer's itch. Swimmer's itch is a type of schistosome. It's not, it doesn't, it's not part of, they're not, we're not their host, so it doesn't cause significant disease within us, but they are hosts of various waterfowl. Mergansers, I think, are one of the predominant causes of swimmer's itch in lakes in, in Michigan. So they occur much like the previous diagram where the adults occur within the human, they occur in the bird host, apes, the larvae and apes, encapsulated larvae are released in feces, they hatch and release in their cilia. Those develop into in the, the host. There are many freshwater snails that are vectors of this particular parasite. The city are released and they would reinfect birds. But the swimming in the water with a beautiful cap like that, that even looks like a Michigan. But if you're swimming in the water, they can get into your skin. Here's an image Kurt Blake and Ford used to teach. I don't know if he us at the UMBS parasitology course. And here's an image of the tail end of these bacteria embedded into human skin. How many people have gotten swimmer's itch? I, you don't, I guess you don't have it, but some people raise their hand if they like. Um, I know I've gotten it. I know some people have gotten it really bad because they were not expecting to get it bad. That's another type of diagenetic fluke. Diagenetic, it's got two hosts. Monogenetic flukes, another clade, those that are just infecting a single host. And most, these are you know, similar in basic anatomy, they've got a pharynx, except for in these cases, the, the digenetic and monogenetic flukes have their mouth near the anterior surface as opposed to the ventral surface, opens up into the digestive tract, the blind gut, they do not possess an anus. They have the opus raptor, opus raptor, opisto, does it have that term on me? Opisto? If not, we'll do it again. I think we had it once. I can't remember what it was for. Opisto. Rear end, the posterior end. That's what it refers to. Opus after. After, I think, means something like a, a, to, to grab hold of or to take. So this is an attachment organ on the rear end of these flukes. On this particular one, that's a ectoparasite of freshwater turtles. It's at the anterior end, and there are a number of different suckers. This one has a number of different hooks that are associated with attachment. So remember, these are attached to the outside of various types of, of vertebrates. And then the last major group, the cestodes, it's tapeworms. Group. 
somewhere around 4,000 species. How many species of mammals are there? About 4,500. So it's a rather large group. Like most, and, and I should say, the, so, the schistosomes are dioecious, but most flukes are monoecious. I'm not forgetting. Most cestodes are monoecious. Look within here, we see yolk glands associated with egg production, testes associated with mouth, and vagina, genital pore, sperm, sperm duct, uterus, ovary. So they have gonads, they're simultaneous hermaphrodites possessing gonads that can produce both male and female gametes. Many, like the digenetic flukes, require two hosts. Intermediate hosts like the snails, the schistosomes. But these, in many cases, at least for the human associated with tapeworms, they're associated with other vertebrates. And then a definitive or final host, which is oftentimes a vertebrate. comprised of a head region with these attachment organs to them, scolex, and no gut, so no mouth, but a scolex, and then a number of distinct segments referred to as proglottids, shown here. Each proglottid contains reproductive organs, so they're capable of producing now, female gametes, there can be internal fertilization. If you have multiple test tubes, they can cross, fertilize, and then and shell larvae, not mates in this case, but shell larvae, this is appropriate, may be released or cold proglottid are released. These occur in the intestines, so they're released in fecal material, and it can be, if they're consumed, by how intermediate hosts, they can then later desist, and then if eaten, eat raw, uncooked meat, you can get infected. It can get bad if you bypass the intermediate state, it can be a rather severe disease. So most of the time, cestodes aren't, unless you get too many of them, they're not going to have a noticeable effect on your health. But where they can, is if you happen to bypass the intermediate host and infect some of the larval stages because they will insist in various parts of the body. I think I was in a book where I saw that. We have a picture of a human brain that had insisted test codes within his world. But that's, if you bypass that, that's not good. If you go direct to the book, it's not okay. So I think in, in, I know there's stories of jockeys who ride horses, who are trying to maintain a certain weight, who well, pop testos to maintain their weight. Not at this stage, at this stage. So they are, they are able to reduce their weight so that they can compete. And I know that in the past, I don't know if they be doing that, but you can buy stages that you can consume, at least in the past, as a kind of a weight loss treatment. I could probably do it in five minutes, but we'll see. The remaining groups are these rather small phyla that, again, we don't really know how closely most of them are related to each other, but at least these two, based on the phylogenetic results and similar metallic constitutional epidermis, at least that character, they seem to be close relatives each other, of each other. So gastrotrix, literally stomach hairs. There are about 800 species. These are marine species that are interstitial. They occur within grains of sediment. So they're benthic, 
occur within sediments. They have a complete digestive tract with an anus at the end. Unlike the taxa we've been talking about already, these are pseudocilimates. These do not, they have a semal, but it's not a true semal. It's not completely lined by mesoderm. Many are monoecious. This one has cave within it, but most are hermaphroditic. But there's some species that are produced by parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis is an asexual mode of, of reproduction in which a female produces an unreduced gamete. So it doesn't go through meiosis. It's a diploid gamete that can directly develop into a female. Naptifera is the clade that includes the remaining species, Naptistomulidica, jaw, little, little jaw mouth, micronathozoas, little jawed animal, ketonath, hairy jaws, rotifers, and acanthocephalus. Naptistomulids. These are marine taxa, again, they're, they're interstitial, relatively small. These do not have an anus, more similar to flatlands, which just have a blind gut. They have jaws located within the ventral mouth. They have acelomate, like flatworms. They have a ciliated epidermis, you can see in this diagram here. And like flatworms, they're monoecious, and they engage in internal fertilization. So, views of their jaws, with a complex jaws for the tiny yeast. Ketonaths, also known as arrowworms, based on their general shape. Marine group, relatively small. Most are pelagic and capable of swimming. Some occur within benthic environments. They have these grasping spines around their mouth and the little jaws within the mouth. These are bizarre things. So ketonaths are now placed close to these other jaw-bearing minute organisms. But they're more similar to Deuter's stones in terms of their development. These two tend to be hermaphroditic. Embryos are so internal fertilization. Embryos are going to be released or brooded. And you can see other features. Anus is here, right here. They've got a postanal tail. Similar for it. They have muscles here. So there's been a lot of confusion about where they lie. At least the molecular phylogenetic results tell us they're, they're not deuterosomes, but there were some, some hints early on that they may be based on their aspects of their development. They have fins, but these are lateral fins. They're capable of, of swimming to some extent by movement of this tail. They have a complete, obviously they have an anus, they have a complete reproductive tract. Micronathozoans we just discovered not too long ago, 20 more, a little bit more, 25 years ago. I think they were finally described in 2000, in, discovered in a freshwater spring. Small little minute organisms with jaw parts associated with their parents. Again, they, they occur within the sand. These are acelomates. They have some bristles associated with them. Don't know much about their development. There's one species described from Greenland and Crescent Islands, which are southeast from Africa. They've also been discovered there. No males are known, so they're presumably parthenogenic. View from the text showing the jaw parts within. And I'll stop there because I want to spend a little bit talking about these last two groups. So we made it through. Seven of the nine. Seven, seven, seven phylum. I didn't quite take the last Talk about them on Wednesday when we begin talking about the animals.